Welcome to the ninth season of the Bates Bobcast, our weekly podcast that takes a look at the week that was in Bates Athletics. And we are just a week away from the start of fall sports competitions at Bates. On this week's episode, we preview the cross country and soccer seasons. Plus, we chat with new Associate Director of Athletics and 1991 Bates alumna Adrian Scheibels. That's coming up on the season premiere of the Bates Bobcast. This Saturday is the 51st annual Bates Cross Country Alumni Meet. Bobcat head coach Danny Feldman is entering his second year at the helm of the program, coming off a very successful 2022 campaign. The Bates women's team is ranked 16th in the country, and the men's team is ranked 21st in the nation, entering the year. Coach Feldman gives us a preview of the alumni meet and the season as a whole for the Bobcats. Well, very excited for the first event of the fall coming up on Saturday. It's the annual Bates Cross Country Alumni Meet. We've got head coach Danny Feldman with us here on the Bobcast. And Danny, first of all, normally this has been for the last 50 years, actually. It's been a cross country alumni meet. Still is a cross country alumni meet, but there's a new dimension this year. Tell us about it. Yes. Our graduating senior last year, uh, Liam Byrne, who was a thrower, came to uh, Coach Johnson, who's the head track coach, and myself proposing adding a throwing event and doing it so in honor of Peter Goodrich, who was on the team, uh, who unfortunately passed away during the 9-11 attacks. And from my point of view, it's a great idea because we have so many people coming back to support. Not everybody runs, and a lot of those that do come back were also throwers. So this gives them an opportunity to dust off their old shoes get in the throwing circle, and just have a little bit of fun before the actual races at noon uh, for all the alum and current student-athletes on the team. Great. So what time do the throws events get going? Uh, 9.30 at the throwing cage uh, next to the softball field, and then at noon there'll be the women's two-mile and the men's four-mile starting at the exact same time right on the outdoor track. Great. And so what what throwing event are they doing? Are they doing the hammer? (laughs) I'm fairly certain it's the hammer. hammer. I don't know what other (laughs) events are going to be going on, but I can't tell you how excited I am to watch it because seeing – alums who haven't thrown in a while get in the circle you get to see them kind of dust off their competitive state and also just see them in their you know in their perfect uh athletic position being in the the throwing circle and it's interesting because i think we did touch on this um when you were first hired here but you were a thrower in college at mary washington and now you're a cross-country coach so how did that happen for you going from being a thrower to coaching cross-country to be clear, I was not a good thrower. I was a thrower, but not a good thrower. Uh, but I I loved distance running even before I started throwing. Mm. And I recognize long term, uh, as we get older, throwing is not something that is optimal for your health, but running is. And so I kind of got more into that when I was going to grad school. And then coaching kind of fell into place with my graduate school studies. And the rest is history. So last year being your first year as a head coach, obviously both teams have a lot of success, both qualifying for the NCAA championships, women matching their best finish ever there at NCAAs. What was the first year uh, at the helm of the Bobcats like for you? It felt like a fire hydrant was uh, shooting water out at the highest pressure and I was trying to take a sip. But in all honesty, it, it flew by because everybody on the team was bought into working together. That was the first year that the program was merged and it it really exceeded my expectations because any kind of change is scary and there's always going to be bumps in the road. But it, it was a lot of buy-in from the beginning and it was more about the the student athletes acclimating to my training and how I coach. And now let's talk about the teams and give us a little bit of a preview of the season coming up. Obviously, the women lose some really key contributors. We know all about what Jill Richardson was able to do. Frida Kicklider had a great year last year as a senior. You do return, though, Elizabeth Holcomb, who was the NESCAC Rookie of the Year. Uh, Phoebe Pohl, who was only a sophomore last season. Um, and, and Jen Casino as well from that Nationals team. So tell us about who you're looking to see um, have a really big year for the women and who maybe who we don't know about who might be stepping up into that starting lineup. Absolutely. The the Demerit twins, one of which Sophie is one of our captains mm. this year, they're both juniors who have put in a ton of training over the summer, uh, as well as Audrey Cole, who was our alternate at Nationals, who, you know, 
that was her first year at college, and she was eerily close to making that lineup. Um, we have those three women off the top, but then we have a several other upperclassmen who have really made huge inroads. Rebecca Anderson, Avery Mathias. Jeez, I feel like I'm I'm blanking. But our our second team. Oh, as well as Chrissy Amon. Mm-hmm. Chrissy yeah. Amon, who was a you know our top middle distance runner last year, has put in a block of training that. Um, you know, it was bordering bordering on, um, you know, testing the limits of the human body. She was putting in seventy mile weeks during the summertime, which is uh, not a, a small uh, figure. But we have a lot of women that are are ready to step up and fill the void for those four that graduated last year. Well, yeah, because Chrissy obviously had a huge track and field season during the outdoor campaign for the Bobcats. She mentioned she'd been injured a little bit um, in the fall and winter, and so it's good to have her back and and maybe possibly one of the leading runners this year, it sounds like. Yeah, and and the beautiful thing about our sport is – uh, people develop over the course of the season. Like I, I was thinking after I, I named a couple of people like Julia White mm-hmm. was out in Indiana, 100 degree heat while doing a research project and putting in the mileage. I think it's just who wants to step up. And that's something that's really cool about our sport. It's very objective. Everybody's competing at the exact same competition so that it makes it really easy for me to see who's willing to compete. Yeah, so after the alumni meet, you have the wave races, which are on a Tuesday this year, which I think is a little bit different. And last year, you kind of used the wave races as sort of a chance for some of the other runners who don't necessarily get into the starting lineup during the regular season to have a chance to compete. You're going to use that similar process this year, a little different perhaps. Pretty similar. So yeah. we are focusing the first years because the distance is less than what they will normally run yeah. at the rest of the other meets for the season, that it's a nice introduction into the season on top of the fact that it's our home course. Two weeks after the fact, we will be hosting a another meet where six teams will be there mm. with everybody running. Uh, the The other side of it, too, is we're having this meet as early as possible because that's the earliest you can have it in order for us to come back for preseason. Mm. And selfishly, this last week was one of the best weeks of preseasons I've ever been a part of with a team. Everybody was excited getting after all the practices and just bringing a lot of energy, which I think you need to establish from the beginning in order to have a good season. You mentioned one of the captains for the women, but tell us who who are the other captains uh, for the women's team? Yes. And speaking of another woman who I forgot who had probably the best workout this past weekend is Isabel May, Mm -hmm. uh, who's a senior as well as Sophie Demerit. And then... Uh, Corinne Cullenberg, who's okay. been battling an injury, and she should be back in the next week. What make them such good leaders to be captains? <sighs> they all treat everybody with respect, and they are never – I would say those three are the least judgmental, caring individuals that we have on our team. And I think that that's so crucial because our sport, you know, it's a year-round affair where if we're just looking at the numbers, you know – people can be easily looked over and they are making sure that not a single person is is um, being overlooked but also that they're having a great experience regardless of where they stand on our team excellent now let's look at the men's team obviously 22nd last year at ncaa strong performance from them you graduate ryan smith you graduate eli besh dining who of course had a great um cross-country and track season last year uh, but you do return some key contributors right ned farrington's back sam cartsonis is back victor caring krista kakani um andrew Motter. So, uh, a lot of depth still on this team isn't there yeah, we have a good problem, especially on the <laughs> men's side, where not only do we have those five men returning, but there are at least eight or nine other men that I know who are genuinely believing, and I also believe that they can fill those other spots on the team for not only the beginning of the season, but especially towards the end of the season. And that puts me in a position to really have to, you know, get in the weeds and to really determine who I think can best help us uh, the championship time. Great. And maybe who are some younger runners who we haven't heard from yet who could be stepping up into that role? On the on the first years, we have, I believe, nine first years mm. that, that came in. And there's not like one that stands out in particular. Usually that is the case. Uh, but this past weekend, we did a workout. It was a broken seven-mile run out of Pineland and all of the guys, I mean, put up times that were better than what some of our upperclassmen did last year, two weeks later at the same course. Um, I will point out, I want to give a shout out though, to one of our first years, Nikhil Chavda is only 16 years old, 
because he came to college early wow. and has been putting on a, a great training cycle right now. Okay. So I think, you know, that in and of itself, I think, is a microcosm where every other guy is like, I'm showing up. He's putting in the work. I'm putting in the work. And it's just, it's created a really good um, energy for all the practices. Outstanding. Who are the captains for the men? Yeah, so we have junior Ben Huston is one of our captains, and the other two is Victor Caring, mm-hmm. and Ned Farrington is repeating as well. And what makes them uh, strong leaders? Yeah, because Ned was a captain last year also. Yeah, yeah so N- Ned was a captain last year. I think Victor is a very even keel and, and provides a calming presence that sometimes when – People's uh, energy and tension can get high when there's a lot riding on a meet, when there's 40 teams there. He usually, to me, can kind of keep things pretty steady. And Ben's a guy who um, I feel like anybody on our team can relate to because he last year came into the season with an injury, fought through it, was our alternate at Nationals, and had a stellar indoor-outdoor season. Um, but he's somebody that I think is is making sure that nobody slips through the cracks, regardless of where they are on the team, and making sure that he's holding everybody accountable. So having those three guys, it's like I'm. It takes a lot of of my. It takes it takes a lot of work off of my plate. Do you, as a coach, encourage a team to set very specific goals in terms of where they want to finish? in NESCACs, in New England's, on the national level. Obviously, you want to win the state meet. Everyone wants to win the state meet. But, I mean, beyond that even, what's your philosophy there? I don't yeah. bring up any of those expectations uh-huh. because I've learned in in the past as a coach that these kids are already dealing with enough anxiety yeah. and pressure as right. it is that if they execute whatever our process plans are on that race day, you know, we finish where we finish. Because I always give the example to them, if you run a minute PR, which you would be – ecstatic about but the team finishes dead last and a lot of the the kids at first are saying oh i'm so upset but we have no control over the outcome we have some control for the performance so we try to focus on a lot of process oriented goals that are controllable which is something that i repeat every day of practice to the point that the kids hate me but it's it's something that's just important because deep down all these kids want to finish high win nescax and you know make it to nationals but the reality is Sometimes, in fact, most times that pressure is not helping in any way, shape, or form. Mm. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned PRs and cross country. It's it's different because it really depends a lot on the course if there's going to be a PR that day or not, right? Yeah. The course, the weather, yeah. the the part of the season that it's in. You know, right now everybody's doing more weekly mileage than they've ever done in their life, and we are trying to hold that for the next eight weeks before we then start to dip it down. Um, but it's one of those things where as long as they are taking care of themselves, the other 21 hours that they're not with me, we are going to have a great season. Like people have come back this sum- from this summer in better shape than any other time from what I've heard from the graduating seniors and seniors on the team right now. And we're going to have a story up on the website soon um, written by one of my colleagues in the communications office, actually, for the college about the cross-country team's first practice here was at Roy's mm-hmm. Disc Golf in Auburn uh, with some ice cream afterwards. Uh, this this has been used before, but you're looking to make it more of a regular type of uh, training ground, right? Every Wednesday until it gets too dark for yeah. us to be out there. <laughs> right. It's, it's mostly flat. It literally mimics what almost 95% of all cross-country courses that we will be on this year are like. Mm. And it's a six minute drive. Yeah. It's soft surface. And John Roy, who owns Roy's Disc Golf and Hamburger, it they are so nice that it's it's been the perfect situation that we've even discussed with him down the road, maybe hosting NCA regionals there. Mm. So interesting. Yeah. So a little bit different than Pineland. Pineland's more hilly, right? Pineland is definitely more hilly. <laughs> this past weekend humbled a lot yeah, of people. Yeah, right. In fact, I even ran there with the team today, and well, it was uh, definitely – it felt good to be out there, but, boy, it's tough. Well, are you uh, – speaking of that, you said you ran with the team. On Saturday, are you going to uh, dust off um, your throwing shoes, <laughs> if you will? I will not subject anybody <laughs> to seeing that. That will be uh, – I don't want to embarrass myself, and I am also trying to be a, a – a a good host to all yeah. those coming back to campus. All right. Well, folks, don't forget the alumni meet is this Saturday. The throws events get started around 9 a.m.? 9.30. 9.30. 9.30 okay. is when it starts, and then yep. noon is when the running noon. event starts. Noon yeah. will be the race. So, Danny Feldman, thank you so much for joining us on the Bobcast and previewing the season with us. Thanks, Aaron.
The women's soccer team is coming off the 2022 season where they posted an overall record of 5, 6, and 4 and a NESCAC record of 1, 5, and 4. The Bobcats get a challenge right away when they visit arch-rival Bowdoin for a match that gets underway at 5 p.m. on Tuesday, September 5th. Head coach Joe Vary is entering his fifth year leading the Bobcats, and he joins the Bobcast for a season preview. Well, next week is the opener for the Vates women's soccer team, and it's at a NESCAC rival in Bowdoin. Head coach Joe Vary with us here on the Bobcast. And coach, first of all, I know fall sports is used to having a pretty quick start to the NESCAC season. How about the season opener, though, being against your biggest rival? What's that going to be like? Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, obviously really interesting because you just literally are jumping right into the fire. Um, but it was uh, it just kind of fell the way it was for the schedules, and we can always move that Bowdoin game a little bit. And between us and, and Bowdoin, it uh, it works for us to get non-conference opponents that following weekend. So, um, you know, it is also, you know, Hamilton Williams uh, open up against each other too traditionally. So it's not a, a quite uncommon thing, but it is uh, you'd like to get one game underneath your belt to, you know, kind of iron out some of the wrinkles. But you know, we're, we're going to have to be pretty well pressed uh, and, and ready to go there for that Bowdoin game. So for the women's team last year, a year where you had four draws in NESCAC play and a big win over Tufts uh, there at Garcelon Field. But, I mean, the four draws, obviously that's due to the new the new rules last year. But tell us about, like, how you feel kind of about that because it seems like you're right there on the brink of being, you know, right there in the pack. Yeah, I mean, we, we're we obviously excited and also um, bummed about those ties. You know, we're, we're excited because we did get results against five teams in the conference. You know, it's something we ha- haven't done in quite some time. A couple of those ties, um, you know, we they felt like losses when mm-hmm. we walked away from it because we felt like we dropped points. Um, uh, one or two of them, I think we were really happy to, to walk away with the tie yeah. because, you know, with the mo- momentum was starting to change. So, uh, yeah, the new rule, I think, will in, obviously increases the amount of ties. But, um, you know, we're, our goal, obviously, this year is to turn those ties into wins and, and start picking up some points because, you know, if a couple of those ties turns the wins, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting in the conference tournament. And, you know, ultimately that's the, the final goal for us. And for you in terms of scoring, I mean, Elizabeth Patrick scored a lot of goals for you during her <laughs> yeah, career, and yeah. she's now graduated. Yeah. So who in the aggregate is going to try to fill that void a little bit? Yeah, uh, Izzy Lucier is a, is a returner for us and, um, you know, has been able to, to score some goals for us. Abby Alter is a, is a junior that's been on a really great progression for us. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to with some of the first years that we have coming in and the attacking piece of things. But we're, we're going to be a school that is going to do it by committee. You know, we're, we're going to have a couple of players that will have three or four goals, hopefully. Um, and I, I think that's a great thing because, you know, we can kind of score you know, from a different uh, couple of, uh, of ways on the field. Um, but that is, you know, the, the goals are, are hard to come by. And, you know, so hopefully we can get a, a couple of players that get hot and score goals. Um, so, but yeah, we'll, we'll see, but we, we're, we're really happy with the, the growth that we have in the attack side of things. And, and so, um, you know, we, we think we'll be able to, to generate some more offense than we have in the last couple of years. A lot of key players, obviously in soccer, don't necessarily score goals. They do other things. So who are some key players who maybe won't show up in the box score with stats, but are really important for the team's success? Yeah. You know, uh, that's, uh, the, the. You got to give some love to the, the players on the defense because there's a no stat line at all for the soccer side of things. Uh, so Charlotte Jones uh, has been a really great player for us, obviously for for a couple of years. Uh, Haley Fenland uh, is a center back, has been a, a great uh, player for us. Um, you know, uh, Ellie Tiska is an outside back. She'll pro- hopefully show up a little bit more on the stat line. She can be an, an assist creator. Um, you know, so we are, like you said, that that's the downside of the soccer side of things. It's not a baseball where it's like loads and loads of stats and basketball. So, um, but those those players day in, day out put in a shift for us. And, um, you know, like I said, we'd love for them to, to continue to get some more love. But, um, you know, we're, we're always supporting them and cheering them in-house. Tell us about your assistant coaching staff this year. Yeah, Devin's a couple weeks in um, and, and doing a really great job um, coming from the great state of Virginia. So back uh, in the area where I kind of did my grad school. So, um, you know, a couple of connections in that area. Um, but been really, really happy with him. Uh, Morgan Johnson's a, a, a returning uh, assistant for us, too. And, and so, you know, she's uh, obviously a lot more comfortable being year two in that. So. Um, we're we're really really happy with the staff that we have, um, and and the feedback from the players and the response from the players has been been real positive. What are some points of emphasis in practice? What are some things your teams really focused on this year to you know make some of those uh, draws into wins? 
Yeah, it's, um, you know, obviously being um, smart on, on the tactical side of things um, and then really us trying to be able to get numbers into danger areas where, where we can score goals. Um, but we're, we do return a good amount of players, so now it is kind of trying to dial in those things a little bit. Um, we we want to try and be able to get out and be a little bit more counter um, in, in, in this season. So, um, But in, in training so far, um, you know, the, the attack's been great. The level's been great. Um, you know, so we're, we're real happy where we are, you know, considering we're only, you know, four days in, five days in. So, like you said, that, that two weeks goes fast before you start playing games. So... Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we, we've been really, really happy where we are. How about the goal situation? Who we have there? Yeah, so we, we've got three great goalkeepers. Uh, Sydney Litney's the first year that's coming in. Uh, Ruby Ryman's our returning junior, and uh, Sam Bunar's uh, is a returning sophomore. So we, we've got a great uh, goalkeeping core, um, and um, it, it's, it's going to be a hard decision for us to find a number one, and I wouldn't be shocked if uh, that position rotates for us a little bit because the three of them are um, very equal in, in that aspect of it. So um, it may come down to who's who's catching fire and who's playing well. It may come to whose strength fits that opponent. Um, you know, so like I said, we'll see, but we're 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 in a very good spot uh, for the goalkeeping core for the, for the next two years, to be honest. Well, as a former collegiate goalkeeper yourself, what are you kind of looking for from that position? Yeah, you know, we we want them to be consistent, um, and so if they they can make all those consistent easy saves and and maybe make that one big save that keeps us into the game. That's a is a really great recipe. Um, all three of them been have been able to show that. Um, you know, and, and modern goalkeeper have to be very good with their feet too, and and so you know we've been been really lucky with them. The the three of them, their feet have been really great, so they're they've been able to to play out, help out, and you know that fits really well with the style that we want to play. I believe the women's soccer team is going to be the first team to play on the new Garcelon Field, an actual match. So are you excited about that? We are excited about that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're, we're pumped. We we had a we had a summer camp, so we closed the old uh, yeah. Garcelon, had a summer camp with the new Garcelon, uh, and and excited. Um, yes, we uh, we host Emerson on that Saturday, which would be a really great non-conference game for us. Um, and and the, they're a good quality opponent. You know, made the national tournament last year, so. Um, it'll be a, a, a fun event to, to break in that turf, and it, it should be a really good match. Great. Well, any other thoughts on the team you wanted to share that we should know about before the season that you, we haven't got to talk about perhaps? You know, I, it is um, just been really, really excited and, and uh, happy with the, the group that we have. They're so much fun to be with. They're putting so much energy into it, um, and it makes the, the job uh, so much more enjoyable in that sense. And um, they are really enjoying their time together and, and working hard. So, um, you know, that piece of things we, we feel is going to carry us very far. So we've been really, really happy with the energy, the work rate um, that they put into. So uh, we feel like that's going to turn into a, a, a good result for us for further the season. All right, Joe Barry, thanks so much. Awesome. Thank you, Aaron. The men's soccer team is coming off 2022 season where they posted an overall record of 6-5-4 and four, and a NESCAC record of 2-5-3. and three. The Bobcats are headed to Boston next week for their opener at Emerson, Tuesday at 6 p.m. Bates class of 2016 alum Noah Riskend is back for a second year leading the program, and he and senior captain and defender Seba Nahanki join us to look ahead at the 2023 campaign. Previewing the men's soccer season here on the Bates Bobcast, we have head coach Noah Riskin and senior captain Saban Nahanke. And Noah, first of all, your second year here at the helm of the program. What are you seeing from the team so far in camp? Preseason's been a blast, Aaron. Um, the boys really care about each other. The boys really push each other. Um, and, yeah, the, the level is really good. The intensity is good, and, and the quality is there. We're a, a really good technical ball-playing team, and, and I think we're going to be pretty fun to watch this year. Great. And Sable, what's it like being a senior captain and stepping into that leadership role? Honestly, a pleasure. I mean, I get to the opportunity to lead 28 guys and represent them on and off the field. And, you know, I, I think I, I've learned a lot the past three years from other great captains before me. And, you know, my role is just to be a representative for all 28 guys and set, the, set an example and set the tone for the season. So I'm going to do my best to do that all year. And what have you seen from Sable that makes him such an effective leader? Uh, Seba is, is a special kid, special person. Um, he's a natural leader, and, and the reason he's a natural leader um, is because of the, the consistency of his mentality. Um, I don't know if I've ever met a kid his age who's um, able to stay so even keel, even in difficult moments. And, um, you know, 
he's not one to to like hog the airtime, you know. Um, but when he speaks, everybody listens because he chooses the right moment to speak up. And and when he speaks, it's it's really really powerful. Um, so to be honest, like there there are a few young people who I have a I mean, if any young people who I have a higher opinion of than than this kid, like he is the absolute man, like great guy. Awesome. And then we got a scrimmage this week before your first real match. So tell us what you're hoping to see from the team and yourself uh, in the scrimmage against Thomas. Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, excitement's pretty high. So we really just want to keep the focus and kind of just execute the culmination of hard work that's been going on since our season ended last October. Um, so, you know, guys will get reps and we kind of just kind of sort things out before we start our regular season next week against Emerson. Um, but it should be exciting stuff. And I know as a head coach, how do you approach a scrimmage like this? Oh, like a regular season game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely sub a little bit more than we normally would because we're still evaluating guys and, and figuring out, you know, who's going to start against Emerson, who's going to play the bulk of the minutes against Emerson. But uh, the approach, you know, in terms of the mentality and, and the way we play the game is, yeah, absolutely like a, like a regular season game. Terrific. And then to follow up on that a little bit, I mean, last year they changed the rules for ties there are no more overtime you end in regulation it's a draw um how did you see that impact things if at all in terms of you know matches and whatnot it definitely led to to a lot more ties um (laughs) right just because a lot of these i mean the overtime games uh you know they're they're sudden death so the overtime games still can end in ties right yeah um but a lot of times you know there were those overtime winners so you just saw uh especially in the nescac standings you know some of the top teams had something like six seven eight ties we had four ties and so um you know it it led to to maybe a little bit more parity i would say um and also i think you know with the double header weekends uh it's not such a terrible thing to to get rid of overtime especially if or extra time i guess i should say but especially if right like on a saturday you have to go to extra time and, and then on sunday you play a team um you know who finished a game in regulation that's that's a great advantage for the other team so to be honest, I'm more than okay with the the getting rid of, of extra time. Um, of course, we got to figure out a way how to turn some of those ties in, into wins. Um, but uh, you know, I think we're we're definitely on the right path. Yeah, and Sable, what do you see as maybe the biggest key to turning some of those ties into wins this year? Yeah, I mean, I really only see that as a benefit for us. Um, just you know, at the end of the day, like. You have to win the game somehow, and now we have a shorter amount of time to do it. So now there's really no worry about playing that extra 30 minutes after the uh, 90th minute whistle blows. So and now we know guys can empty the tank for 90 minutes and not have any excuses not to do so. Um, and I think we have the guys to do that. And then are you a big goal setter, like, in your mind in terms of what you want to see from yourself and from your teammates this year, anything you talk with them about, you know, as a captain, about what you want to see from everybody? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, like in my head, I, I set goals, and I, I, t- I'll, I tell guys at the beginning of the year to to set goals, but at the same time, we, we want to take things game by game. I think historically, we tend to look a little too far ahead, and this year we kind of have the mentality that we need to win the game that's next. We need to focus on the practice that's next, just full steam ahead and not get too overexcited about what's down the road and we're going to take care of business of what comes first um so yeah. excellent and then noah uh, in terms of obviously last year tiffa agunile had a huge year all region um all nescac who else can we look out for in terms of goal scorers this year for base uh, a lot of options tiffa was also the leading goal scorer in the nescac yep. as well which was a huge achievement um you know i think caesar hoover um mm-hmm. will contribute with some goals uh i think uh, Harry Corman could could chip in with some goals. Um, Wilson Smith as well. Um, you know, I think we're we're going to kind of approach the the center forward position, the nine, a little bit by committee. Um, so you know, I think we we should be able to to spread out the scoring load a bit. But you know, um, Tefe is looking great as always, and and yeah, I think in general the the team is looking really dangerous um, in attack. And who are some glue guys who are really important who may not show up in the stats with goals but are really important to the team's success perhaps? Um, Sebastian Yakovidi, of, of course, is, is a really important player for us. You know, he played um, almost every minute as, as a first year and, and the kid has massive heart. Um, you know, in the back, guys like, like Seba and, and Simon Clark and Henry Kunstler and I think Kabi Namako could, could contribute this year as well. Rex Chu as well as a, as a really talented defender. Um, David Ortiz, great, great midfielder. 
Good name for New England also. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's too bad he doesn't wear number 34, but um, it is what it is. Uh, maybe we can make that happen next year. Um, but, uh, no, it's it's a... Uh, it's a team with a lot of ability. It's a it's a team with a lot of depth, and and so I think a lot of different guys are, are going to step out. Uh, excuse me, step up over the uh, over the course of the year. And who are uh, people in line to play goal this year? Uh, we have three goalkeepers. We have uh, Trevor Hammond. Um, we have Eric Jansen, and we have Hayden Bernhardt. Are our options in goal? So right now it's a battle there a little bit. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> and then Seba, just any other thoughts you wanted to share on the team in general? What your you know any other thoughts you want to mention we haven't got to talk about yet? Yeah, I mean. Uh, not much, but I just think the overall vibe of the team is is really great this year. Something that I haven't felt and on a team in a while, um, and I think that should help us come together uh, during hard times. And hopefully that translates to some wins. Because at the end of the day, we we want to make NASCAR playoffs, and uh, you know who knows what can happen from there. So we're just excited to get going, and and yeah, we'll see what's next. Great. No, any other thought, any other thoughts you wanted to share? Um. I, may, I maybe already said this, but uh, it's it's just been a joy working with this team so far. Um, the togetherness, uh, the love that they have for each other, um, it's 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 truly special. Um, so you know he's he's really not exaggerating when um, when Seba says that. So you know I, I just think the you know how much these guys care about each other um, is is going to take us a really long way. I hope you know. All right, Noah Riskin, Seba Hanky, thanks so much. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. This year, the NCAA is celebrating the 50th year of Division III athletics. Throughout the year, we'll be chatting with Bobcats past and present about their experiences competing as D3 student athletes. New Bates Associate Director of Athletics Adrian Scheibels was not only a 1,000-point scorer at Bates, graduated in 1991, she also was a wildly successful head coach at, yes, Bowdoin, where for 12 seasons, she took the Polar Bears to the top of the sport, including a 31-2 season that ended with Bowden finishing national runner-up in 2019. We're sure glad she's a Bobcat again. Well, happy to have one of our newest staff members here in the athletic department, but a longtime Bobcat, Adrian Scheibel, is with us here on the Bobcast. And Adrian, just take us back to when you were actually in high school and you ended up coming to Bates, played basketball here. What made uh, Bates the place for you coming out of high school? Yeah, I was. I uh, grew up in very rural Maine, and... Um... I think was blessed to have a friend from high school whose parents had gone to Bates. I was all set to put my application in to go to UMaine, um, which is wonderful and all. But as soon as I visited Bates with my high school friend, I knew that it was the right place for me. I could continue to progress as a student athlete. Um, I'd started playing basketball late, and so I didn't I didn't want to be done with sport. I wanted to continue to grow and develop through sport. And so it was a place where I knew that I, I could compete and be a, a, a student athlete, be challenged and supported in the classroom and do even more than that, you know, really get involved with with service opportunities. Um, And uh, I also had four jobs as a student. So I I don't know, I feel like it was just a wonderful way for me to grow and develop in a lot of different ways. Did much recruiting take place back then? Or did you (laughs) kind of show up and say to Marsha Graff, I want to play basketball? How did that go? It pretty much went like that. Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I do know that she sent someone to watch me play at the state championship game. Um, Lee Campbell was her was her scout. Okay. Uh, yeah, he was the director of financial aid here. I'm right. sure a lot of Bobcats know that. Um, but he also kept the clock at the That's main right. state tournament. And so he watched me compete. And Marsha did send me some really nice handwritten notes. And um, But that was really the extent of recruiting back then. And you also played a year of softball, right? A year of softball, a year of track. Okay. A, little bit a year of everything. rugby. I, just, I dabbled in a lot of different things, um, but, you know, eventually just knew that I needed to, to spend my off seasons focusing on basketball. And, um, you know, the, the experience of being a D3 athlete, what, what did you really take away from it? What was the major, you know, takeaways for you in terms of what that kind of taught you and, and helped you, you know, going forward kind of? Oh, my heavens. Well, it gave me so much. I think first and foremost, um, my confidence uh, grew through sport and through my experience as a Division Three student athlete. Um, my experience in the classroom really um, supplemented that growth and that, you know, it, here at Bates, you're kind of forced to um, participate and um, have a voice. And that was really good for me that my professors pushed me in that way. So I think the combination of being um, a student and an athlete really grew my confidence in a lot of different ways. I was also 
really blessed to have a lot of strong female role models here in my time. Uh, you know, the the athletic director was female. My coach was the first female coach I'd ever had in Marsha Graf. Um, and uh, so I think it also just provided me with uh, a map to my future career that I hadn't even considered before I arrived at Beats. Did Marsha Graf's influence kind of make you want to be a coach? Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, Late in my tenure at Bates, I think it was the summer before my senior year, she invited me to attend um, a YES clinic. The NSA put on these YES clinics, which uh, youth education, education through sport. And so I traveled with her to the Midwest to put on this clinic for um, some uh, some youth that wouldn't have had the opportunity otherwise. And I think that was a defining moment for me. And she gifted me that opportunity. What did it mean to you to be a thousand point scorer for the Bobcats? Um, it's it it's incredible, honestly, and incredible because I've always considered myself to be sort of a role player and mm-hmm. someone who did the dirty work. Um, in high school, I played for you know a, a very uh, good basketball team, and I was tasked with just, you know, rebounding the basketball and defending. That's my coach made it really clear what my role was. And I loved my role. And so to come to Bates and be asked to score the basketball was pretty darn cool. (laughs) Um, And so I think I never expected to reach a thousand point plateau. So it's something I'm really proud of. But I do want to mention that I had two classmates who did it before me, which is even more impressive. Um, So, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of that. And then after, obviously, you graduated from Bates, you, you, you went into coaching, and you eventually became the head coach at um, that school in Brunswick, <laughs> Bowdoin, uh, a very successful head coach at Bowdoin. Was it weird at first to be coaching the Polar Bears, or did you just jump right into it? It wasn't weird. I mean, by the time, you know, I, I got that job, yeah. I, I had, you know, I had spent a lot of years coaching yeah. at Swarthmore and other institutions. Sure. Um, so it was pretty f- distanced from my experience at Bates. That being said, I will say it was incredibly weird to come to alumni gym and um, and to be the away team. And, um, you know, I, I, I just have such a love for that for that place. So I would say it wasn't very it wasn't weird unless we were playing Bates. And then, yeah, it did feel strange. <laughs> Certainly. And then obviously, um, you know, a lot of success with the Polar Bears. And um, in terms of being a D3 coach, how, how do you see things kind of evolve from when you were a player. I mean, mm-hmm. we were coaching at the D3 level in terms of what D3 has become now compared to what it was when you were playing. Oh, my heavens. Well, yeah, it's really um, – the landscape has changed dramatically. I mean, when I was here, we were not allowed to compete for an NCAA um, title or, you know, qualify for the NCAA tournament. And so there are a lot of fantas- fantastic teams in the NESCAC during those years that I think would have won national championships, um, including our volleyball team. But uh, so that has changed. And I think, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's become I don't want to say the professionalization of of sport, but the definitely the NESCAC has become a lot more competitive. Um, and it's been really exciting to see the growth of, of, of sport through the years. I mean, yeah, there's active recruiting now. There really wasn't. Absolutely. Yeah. Previously. Mm-hmm. Yes. And now you're back at Bates. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what appealed to you about coming back in an administrative role as opposed to coaching? Yeah, you know, I've spent a lot of over 20 years coaching yeah. um, and obviously started the, the first few years of my um, journey were spent as an assistant coach and then ultimately got my first head coaching job at 26 and have spent a lot of, year doing, a lot of years doing it and um, was really looking for a new challenge. I feel like with my experience as a Division three student athlete and coach, I feel like those experiences, um, it's my deep hope that those those experiences will really um, help me to be um, a strong administrator here and voice for student athletes and the coaches. Um, so, you know, when presented this opportunity to come back to my alma mater and serve in a different capacity, um, I jumped on it. How is Bates uh, similar or different from when you were a student? Wow. Well, the campus has changed dramatically mm. in a really positive way. Um, and, you know, it's it's nice to see that I think there have been some nice upgrades in alumni gym, but not too much. You know, right. we alum, we love our, we love that space. And um but yeah, no, I I am really proud of the the way that Bates has grown and developed um, since I've graduated here, 
And I'm so excited to come back and be be a part of it. The people here are second to none. I mean, and it's a true community. It definitely feels like we're all on the same team. I really love to get to know some of the campus partners that we um, we, we deal with um, through athletics, and they're so supportive and wonderful. So um, I feel blessed to be here. A few years ago, I think it was last year or the year before, you were inducted into the Maine Basketball Hall of Fame. What did that honor mean to you? Wow, it was overwhelming. Um, Huge honor. Uh, to be on the stage with those those people, other people that were inducted. I mean, I was just, I don't know what to say other than, you know, it was an incredible honor. And to have one of my former student athletes, you know, introduce me and speak about me um, was something I'll never forget. And obviously, um, you know, being an alum, you were coaching at Dartmouth, but to witness Bates maybe from afar, women's basketball, win the NESCAC title, for the first time ever. What was that like to see? Ah, oh, so proud. <laughs> yeah. It was amazing. Allison's just done such an amazing job with the the program and to watch them rise in that fashion and you know, to be so fearless in so many different situations throughout that tournament. It was I was definitely a proud Bobcat alum. Certainly. And then um I guess just any other thoughts you want to share on the you know, what some of your goals are maybe for this year, being your first year back uh, as a Bobcat, uh, you know, now working on staff in terms of what you want to kind of hoping to see and accomplish and whatnot. Yeah, a lot of my responsibilities really fall under student support. So I'm really excited to, um, I'm, it's just like really incredible to see these students come back and the campus feels alive now. So I'm looking forward to working with them in a bunch of different capacities and supporting them um, in various areas. Um, My job also like includes, you know, coaching um, development and support. So I'm looking forward to that Um, and engaging in a lot of alumni events and fundraising um, for our teams here at Bates. So, I mean, that's a lot that I just mentioned. I'm looking forward to kind of getting one academic year under my belt and getting a feel for the place and how it operates. Um, But um, I have big plans to, to give back and um, I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. I was going to mention that, yeah, I mean, your coaching background obviously is entirely basketball, but um, there's universal truths about coaching, right, you can yeah. probably help out with. What, what are some of the things you emphasize to people? I think it's really important to um, stay true to who you are as a coach. There's a lot of different styles out there. And working with some of the younger coaches already, you know, I've emphasized to them that um, – you know, I'm going to give them advice and support them, but it's really important that they be true to who they are, to their leadership style um, and their philosophy. But um, we are blessed to have some really talented coaches within our department. So I feel like I'm learning from them as much as they're learning from me. And um, that's really exciting. All right. Adrian Scheibel class of 1991, back as a Bobcat now as Associate Director of Athletics. Thanks so much for joining us on the Bobcast. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Next time on the Bates Bobcast. We'll preview the volleyball, field hockey, women's golf, and tennis seasons. September 5th marks the first competitions of the fall, so stick with GoBatesBobcats.com for all the latest Bates athletics news. And we'll catch you next time on the Bates Bobcast. Bates, Bates.